We're prisoners of time more than we are of space. With space, we have some leeway. If we don't like where we are, we can move to another point in space. When you're in one point in time, you can't go to another point. We feel this especially as death approaches. If people could, they would run in the other direction. And in their minds, they try. They go running back to events in this lifetime, trying to grab hold of this, grab hold of that. And that's why they die with craving and clinging, which moves them on to another rebirth. And because it's done in desperation, often we grab hold of the wrong things. So one of the purposes of meditating is to learn how to die well, die with skill, to get prepared beforehand, to know where to focus our attention, what to hold on to if we have to hold on, where we can let go. So we're not so desperate. In other words, we go into death and we don't try to run away. The importance of this skill is obvious, especially now with the death all around us. As the Buddha points out, there are four reasons why people are afraid of death. They're afraid of missing out on human sensual pleasures. They're afraid of leaving their bodies. They start thinking of the cruel and unkind things they've done in this lifetime, and they're afraid there may be some punishment on the other side. Or they're simply unsure. Is death followed by annihilation? Well, what's it followed by? In other words, in the Buddhist terms, they haven't seen the true Dharma. And it's in the triple training that we learn the skills that can overcome these fears. not only overcome the fears, but also have the tools we're going to need to die well. As we practice virtue, we avoid cruel behavior, the kind of thing that would, might deserve punishment someplace. We look back on our actions, and there's nothing with which we can criticize ourselves. That sense of confidence is going to be important as we approach death. As a fear of losing, leaving the body, leaving sensual pleasures, the practice of concentration is good for that. We've learned through concentration that there is a pleasure that doesn't require sensuality at all. In fact, it's possible only when you put sensuality off to the side. Think of the definition of right concentration. Secluded from sensuality, secluded from unskillful qualities. You find pleasure and rapture based on that seclusion. So it's focused here on the breath. The pleasure that comes when the breath flows well doesn't count as a sensual pleasure. It's a pleasure of form. It's a higher level of pleasure. It doesn't have all the drawbacks of sensuality. It has a few drawbacks. It is, after all, something fabricated. But it's fabricated with scale, fabricated with knowledge. And it's the kind of pleasure that doesn't require that you deny the harm that you may be caused with this pleasure, because there is no harm. And it doesn't obscure the workings of the mind. When you're dealing with sensual pleasures, you're focused totally on the object. You don't like to think of the machinations that go into creating the allure of sensuality. It's like watching a play. You don't want to think about all the machinations behind the scenes that require the scenery to work. 
You want to go for the illusion of reality in the play. And sensuality requires that we have that sense of illusion. Whereas the mind in concentration, even though there is a lot of pleasure, it doesn't require that you turn a blind eye to what you did to get the pleasure. In fact, you can see it even more clearly. So it helps get over that craving for human sensuality. As for fear of losing the body, when the mind really settles down, the sense of the awareness that comes here, right here in the present moment, becomes more and more pronounced, to the point where the awareness of the breath actually separates out from the breath. In the beginning, we work to put these things together. Breath, body, feelings, a feeling of pleasure. We want the pleasure to fill the body. We want our awareness and breath to fill the body. They're all there together. They do get a sense of oneness, especially if, as you can drop the direct of thought and evaluation. You're just there with that sense of perceiving the breath, aware of the breath, and the mind and its object seem to become one. But the paradox here is that as they become one, eventually they will separate out again. But this time they separate it out not in line with your preconceived notions, but simply by their very nature. They're there together still, like oil and water in a bottle. As they settle down and are still, the water separates to one side, the oil separates to the other. Then you can focus directly on the awareness itself. You can focus on the sense of space. You can focus on awareness itself. There seem to be no bounds to them. You realize that this pleasure is even greater than the pleasure that came with being with the breath. It's more peaceful. This helps overcome your attachment to the body. You realize that it is possible to be aware. And not to have to think about body at all. And it's this ability to separate these things out. This is the skill that you're going to need as death comes. You read in John Mahabu's teachings to the woman who was dying of cancer. And this was the teaching repeated over and over again. Try to get so you can see that body is one thing, feeling is something else, mind is something else. In other words, the awareness is something else. So that when feelings of pain come with death, you can go to that sense of being separate. And the awareness will realize that as the body falls away, it hasn't lost anything. As the feelings fall away, it hasn't lost anything. It doesn't have to go into those things. And it's his ability to separate these things out. This is what is the skill that's going to enable you to see the true Dharma. So we end up with no doubts about what happens at death. Because in seeing the true Dharma, you realize that you actually do step out of space and time. And in stepping out, you begin to realize that the amount of time you've been through didn't begin back in 1949 or 1955 or 1964 or whatever the year you were born this time around. Way, way back. And you realize that what kept you going from one life to the next to the next to the next was your unskillful actions. What prevented you from seeing the true Dharma was your unskillful actions. This is why people come back from this experience of stream entry. And they would never want to break the precepts ever again. And they have no doubts about the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. That the Buddha, what the Buddha taught was true. There is a deathless element. It's an awareness. It's not quite the same awareness as the awareness in concentration. But it's an awareness that can be accessed 
by learning the skill of separating body, feelings, and mind. Those first three of the frames of reference in establishing mindfulness. This is the skill that enables you to step beyond and totally overcome your fear of death and to be able to handle death well. So try to develop a heightened sense of the value of the triple training, or what the Buddha calls training in heightened virtue, heightened awareness, heightened discernment. Because they really do take the mind to another level. They're probably the most basic teaching in the Buddha's arsenal. And the reason they're basic is because they are so useful in so many ways especially with dealing with the big issues of life and death, of learning how to stop the suffering that we've been creating for ourselves. And releasing us from this prison in time. 